Hello, everyone. Thank you for attending today's webinar. I am Angela Torres from Streetwave Wireless, and I am joined by Jason Wahi, where he will be walking you through today's presentation on lightning and surge protection for wired and wireless networks. This webinar will be recorded and we will share with everyone afterwards and will be posted on our YouTube channel. The question and chat box is open, so at any time during the presentation, please type your questions and we'll get them answered at the end of the presentation. Jason, you may go ahead and begin. As Angela mentioned, my name is Jason Meese. I'm the Director of Sales for Infant Electronics. Infant Electronics is the owner and operator of all of the brands that you see on this screen here. We have a fantastic long-running partnership with Streakwave under four of these brands you're probably familiar with, Polyphaser, Transductor, KP, and Radio Waves. Today, we're going to talk about Transductor and Polyphaser, focusing on ensuring that fixed wireless systems remain free from uh, signal integrity issues due to transient or surge events. Transdector, we have over 50 plus years playing in the surge protection market. Uh, a lot of the different technologies used out there today, we have brought to the industry and fine tuned and turned into the, the technology you see out there today. We have a fantastic uh, technical support network out there available to help you with your questions. If you need anything as far as how do I install this? How do I ground this? What's this rated for? And Streakwave doesn't happen to have the answer. Feel free to call us. We'll we'll provide you with that information. If there is copper enter or entering or leaving your facility, we have a solution for the protection of that copper line, whether it's RF, AC, DC, or data. And under Infinite Electronics, we believe in the availability model. So we want to make sure that these products and solutions are available for you for same day shipping. If Streakwave doesn't have it on their shelf, that's fine. Contact Streakwave and they can have it drop shipped to you from our facility. We are seeing an increase in fixed wireless deployed out there today. The reason why is not only because of the reliability of that system to deliver um, internet and, and wireless information to customers uh, also because it's easier to install, right? Fiber is hard to put down, coax is hard to put down. A wireless network is, is much easier to put out there, put a, a radio, put an antenna on a pole and boom, you can get service to customers. This is fantastic except if you have one lightning event come around all of a sudden that wireless system is corrupt. All of a sudden your end users and your customers no longer believe in the reliability of that system. So therefore putting good working surge protection out there will help you with not only your maintenance costs, but also your overall reputation of your customers. So what is this surge event we're talking about here? A surge is a microsecond event. It, it's fa uh, faster than any fuse or breaker can react. These microsecond events can do a lot of different things to your equipment. Um, they can cause uh, damaging uh, board level type problems. They can degrade your equipment over time. Maybe you're thinking you're gonna get 30 years out of a radio and instead you only get five. That could be due to degradating uh, surge events populating on that, on that radio over time. And then the one that everybody's familiar with is the, de the destruction, right? You've got lightning that hits and all of a sudden things catch on fire and smoke and carbon happens. All of those types of surge related issues, transductor polyphaser can help with. So as I mentioned, these events will, will interrupt, delay, corrupt the signal. So we want, we want, to, we want to mitigate that uh, as much as possible. So what do we do? We design these surge protection devices to react right above, uh, engage and divert that, the, uh, the surge energy right above the nominal level of the equipment you're trying to protect. This diagram here shows an example of how that works on an AC system, okay? So you've got your fine, normal AC sine wave rolling through, putting power into your system, and then all of a sudden there's a spike, a transient event. When that transient event occurs, your surge protector that's sitting there in parallel and doing absolutely nothing engages, diverts that energy to ground. Right, so now we're taking that spike, we're clipping that energy as close to the nominal of the of nominal of the equipment you're trying to protect, and divert that energy to earth ground. Okay. So there's a lot of different technologies out there that are used in the surge protection world, and none of them are perfect. 
Anybody tells you they have a perfect surge protection technology, run because it's just not true. Every technology has a pro and a con. Gas discharge tubes were one of the first technologies used back in the early 70s. And they have um, very robust energy handling capability. They are not expensive, but they degrade over time. So every time a gas tube engages and diverts surge energy to ground, the gas in that tube ionizes, creates that path. And the next time that it sees an event, it takes longer. And then the next time longer, and then the next time longer. So eventually you do reach end of life on a gas tube. Metal oxide varicitors, they don't degrade as fast as gas tubes. Um, they're very robust, like, like a gas tube, and they don't have, they don't have a, 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 they have a longer life and a better reaction time than a gas tube. But again, they do have a shelf life as well. And they tend to have a, a higher clamping level or a higher VPL than the next technology I'm gonna talk about, which is silicon avalanche diodes. Silicon avalanche diodes, that is uh, Transtector's claim to fame. We've been uh, fine tuning SAD technology for almost 50 years now, over 50 years now. And the SADs or silicon avalanche diodes are solid state components, okay? So when they see that surge event, like a switch, they engage and divert the energy to ground. And then they turn right back onto the, the state they were at before with no degradation and it's an instantaneous reaction time. That may sound, wow, that's, that sounds great, right? But they can't handle as much energy as a gas tube or an MOV. So they have a right place or they should be used in conjunction with gas tubes and MOVs to be able to provide the best of both worlds in the protection levels, both robust and fast acting. Now, I have a lot of uh, folks come to me with issues and problems out there, and they, they don't understand why um, their fuses and breakers aren't reacting or why the surge protectors aren't doing the right job or why the surge protector wasn't repetitive. And so it's important to understand the difference between a transient event and an overvoltage. All right. So the transient event is your microsecond event, as I, man as I mentioned. So if you look at the, the sine wave here, you'll see that brief spike, okay? Your over voltage can last for seconds or minutes. And that's when you want fuses or breakers in place to help protect your equipment. Now, if we have a surge protector in place, we will sacrifice and, and under that over voltage event and protect your equipment as well. But that's not what we, what we call a repetitive type event that we would, we would protect from. So microsecond event, overvoltage event is minutes or seconds and surge protectors react in nanoseconds, okay? So that's why, uh, that's why the SPDs can capture that microsecond event and divert it to ground so well because of our reaction time. Okay, so we're seeing a lot of ethernet applications out there where we got uh, radios being powered by um, Ethernet cables, PoE, power over Ethernet. And um, because of that, uh, we're seeing uh, a need for surge protection on those applications. Those Ethernet cables have individual copper lines inside of them. And since we're dealing with low voltage, it doesn't take much over voltage to knock that signal off, off kilter and to, to interrupt the, uh, the signal or to damage the equipment. So it's important that we protect this ethernet system here. So we wanna put surge protectors at both the top and the bottom of the pole, okay? Wanna put power protection at the bottom as well. We wanna make sure we're using shielded cables and shielded receptacles. You want a surge protector with a dedicated shield to ground protection mode. These ethernet protectors should have a low turn on, right? So we're mostly dealing with 48 volt DC systems. So we wanna clip as close to that 48 volt level as possible. Um, we want repetitive capabilities. There are a lot of inexpensive white labeled surge protectors out there that have one or two gas tubes in them. And we call them one and done devices that you have to go out and replace after every storm. That's not the way it should be. You should use surge protection that is repetitive so that you don't have to do that. And then under an extreme circumstance, you want those surge protectors to act as, act as your sacrificial lamb rather than your radio. Okay, so it's as easy as ABC to get your system protected. Protection at the top, protection at the bottom, shielded cables, shielded jacks. Make sure you're using low turn on voltage, repetitive capabilities, and you will protect your ethernet line. 
So a couple of um, applications we'll go over here real quick where you can wonder, all right, should I put protection here? Should I not protect, put protection here? We're seeing a lot of private networks go out there. Perhaps you're working on a stadium and you're putting an AP up at the top of the stadium like this. You may say to yourself, I'm not on a pole. I'm not on a tower. Do I need surge protection here? And the answer is yes. In these types of locations where you're spread out and you're the highest point in the area, whether it's in an oil gas refinery location or a mining location, or maybe it's a substation, you need to put protection here. Here's another application. So this is one where you may say, okay, I'm outdoors, but look, my cable runs really short. Maybe I don't need protection here. Oh, but I'm, I'm at the ocean, right? So I get storms rolling in very often. So I'm in a high lightning area. Oh, and then I remember this radio is being used for some sort of a critical safety related application. So, you know, my, my return on investment for installing a, installing a surge protector is going to be positive. So I want to install a surge protector here just to, in case to prevent against this lightning event or potential surge event. Now, here's my cousin Skippy. He's installing an AP for a Wi-Fi system in, in, indoors. No exposure. It's low cost. It's not a critical application. No protection needed here. Okay. So, a couple of the products that we uh, recommend for these Ethernet applications I just went over. We've got the uh, DPRF140. That would be your indoor rated surge protector that will go down at the bottom. Um, the ALPU F140 is your outdoor rated surge protector that would go up at the top. They both have the same circuit topography, so you end up with a linear protection system. They both have gas tube and SAD in series for each copper pair. So SAD, remember, low turn on. So that's going to do most of the work. It's going to clip that energy as close to the nominal as possible and divert it to ground. It'll do so repetitively without degradation. If you see a super large event though, you have a gas tube to back it up. So that means that we can protect you against both the low level events and the major events. In addition, number one here, if you can see that on the screen, that is a very unique transtector, uh, is the only one to have dedicated shield to ground protection. So as I mentioned, proper protection for an ethernet line you want shielded cables, you want shielded receptacles. Whatever populates on that shield will follow the shield to the shielded receptacle. You don't want that con contaminating the copper pairs in the ethernet cable. You don't want it touching your data lines. So we have a dedicated isolated shield to ground protection component that will take that energy off the shield, divert it to ground without getting it anywhere near your signal lines. So this device is uh, the outdoor rated device. It's in a UV, UV um, rated uh, outdoor corrosion resistant enclosure. Um, and actually here, I'll show you another picture here in a moment. Let's talk about the DPR first though. So the DPR is installed in a couple of different ways. You can just put it in series to your equipment and then apply a ground line. Or you could take the DPR and you can put it on a DIN rail and you can ground the DIN rail. If you have other components on a DIN rail, that's, uh, that's usually, um, an attractive method, or you can put it in a full rack um, if you have multiple lines coming down. For the ALPU, you want to put this out there on a pole. We have a mounting kit available, the ALPU Fit Kit, that can uh, help you mount that onto the pole. You take your mid-span wire, you put it in on the left, you take your jumper cable, you take it out on the right. You want to make sure you're properly grounding this device, right? We recommend a number 12 uh, ground wire. Uh, be used and there is a ground lug provided. There are two little grommets on here that you pull out, as you see in that yellow ring with the white arrow, that will make it so if any condensation builds up inside the, the device, it can, it can drain out. I just had a customer with this problem where uh, they did not pull those grommets and they have an installation out near the ocean and sure enough, the condensation built up there and it was salt water. And I, you know, they sent me the picture and I saw the corrosion in there. And if they had pulled those grommets, you know, because we did it on other devices, we know they wouldn't have had that issue. So um, that's a unique characteristic to the Transtector ALPUF 140. Um, 
And down on the bottom, you can see it closed up. You can put a twist tie on there if you want to lock it up, but it's a real nice compact device. It fits in the palm of your hands. If you have multiple radios up at the top that are ethernet fed, you could use our MDPS and that would have multiple DPRs inside of it. So you could do up to eight radios protected off of one cabinet with eight DPRs in it. They'd all be on the same ground plane. They'd all be grounded at the same point, which is um, which is ideal for this kind of an application. And they would all use that same um, hybrid SAD gas tube surge protection we talked about before. Okay, so one misconception I do hear out there a lot is, oh, I don't need surge protection because I have my mid-span in place. And my mid-span has, has some surge protection built into it. You can go to transtector.com. We have a, a nice white paper on that subject that explains exactly why you don't want to rely on mid spans as your surge protector. Um, there's no need for that, right? The mid span surge protection built into it is designed to help against low level you know, events. You don't want that mid span to be your sacrificial lamb. Um, it's too expensive. So uh, let's take and use a surge protector as a sacrificial lamb, and then you can use one of our mid spans um, to do your power injection if necessary. And while we're on the topic of white papers on transsector.com, you'll see there's a lot of different white papers available on uh, best practices for installing ethernet protection and ethernet systems as well. Okay, so moving to DC protection. So we're seeing a lot of fiber fed radios being deployed these days. And those fiber fed radios, they're, they're, the fiber is dielectric, so they don't need surge protection on there. Bummer for us here at Transtector, but the good thing for us is that they do still need to run power up there to the radio. So they do that using a DC feed. You have to protect that DC feed. So you're running a positive and a negative up the tower. That requires protection, best practice, from each leg to ground. So you want to protect, protect at minimum, positive to ground and negative to ground. So when you look at a DC system, we want that power to run in one direction only, right? We design these systems specifically for that. Um, and when we design these systems, we look at that and we say, oh, well, I only want the power to run in one direction. Well, quite often, what do we use to block power from going in the reverse direction? We use a diode, right? So hence, silicon avalanche diodes are an ideal technology to use for any DC protection application. And as you can imagine, Transtector has SAD-based DC protection solutions for this application. So you're running a copper pair up the tower. You would want protection up at the top and the bottom. So the protection up at the top would look like what you see over there on the left, the DC Defender. It's in a very ruggedized outdoor um, aluminum enclosure. You can bring two wires up and you can bring two wires out or you can bring multiple wires out. Say you have a couple different radios up there and um, you wanna feed them off a of one DC line, you can actually use the DC Defender to act as your DC distribution. And note the DC Defender is, uh, approved by several radio OEMs out there. And, and um, a lot of the radio OEMs recommend it for use on their, on their applications. Down at the bottom, you'd wanna use the CPX. So I like this picture here because you can actually see the three modes of protection using the silicon avalanche diode stack. So if you can see that right below that blue arrow, that's those are silicon avalanche diode stacks that's how Transdector uh, designs our SADs. We make sure that we take our stacks and we put the SADs in a way that we can fully use the surface space, space of each component. And then we install them so that the three are, there's one for positive to ground, there's one for negative to ground, and then there's one additional bonus level of protection that goes across line to line. So by creating this type of protection uh, circuitry here, this does categorize the CPX as um, carrier grade protection. Um, so you can take that carrier grade protection, you can put it in the four port chassis you see there, or you could fold it in a, put in a full rack mount chassis as well. I really like the four port chassis. This is pretty cool in that you can protect you know, uh, 
two DC feeds, you can put two DC modules per chassis, and then there's a DIN rail mounting bracket on there as well. So if you're trying to fit some DC protection in a tight cabinet down at the bottom of the tower, you could put a couple of these on a DIN rail and um, and really you know provide optimal protection with a really small footprint. Okay, so we're going to move on to RF protection here. Um, even though we see more and more fiber going up there uh, on the tower, there's still some coax lines going out there and polyphaser is the Kleenex of surge protection. Um, when you hear people talk about RF protection, they usually use polyphaser synonymously with that term. And there's a reason for that. Um, polyphaser is, is, is tried and true. They protect a lot of radios out there and have done so for a long time. Um, so why do we need an RF surge protector? So you have this coax line that has a, a center pin and a shield. And when an event populates onto a tower and contaminates the cable, the shield, um, I'm sorry, the cable, it, it contaminates the shield and the center pin and travels at two different rates and two different speeds. So even the lowest level transient event is gonna interrupt your signal if you don't have protection um, at the radio, okay? Um, so we, recommend uh, RF protection down at the radio in a DC block application, meaning you're not putting power on the coax cable. So if you're not putting power on the coax cable, you can use one of our devices like a TSX, that's the device on the left. And the TSX has um, uh, spiral coiled inductor technology that has an instantaneous turn on time. So that's a major differentiator between polyphaser and our competitors is that a device out there that uses a gas tube is gonna have a lag between the, the surge event and the time it engages. So that means that there's gonna be some energy that passes through to the radio. By using this type of inductor-based technology that polyphaser puts out there, the instantaneous turn on means no energy goes through to the radio. In addition, I told you before, gas tubes degrade over time, right? Well, inductors do not. Inductors, you put this inductor-based technology out there today, it'll protect your radio just as well today as it would 30 years down the road. It doesn't degrade, there's no, uh, it's 100% mechanical. There's no degrading components. Now over on the right, if you have a DC pass application where you're running power up the coax line, you need to put protection at the top and the bottom and you use, need to use a, a slightly different style of protector where we actually um, use inductor-based technology to take the, the, the power off the center pin, bypass it through a, a trifecta of surge protection components and then put it back on the center pin and bring it to the radio. So we're taking all of that power and all that data and any surge energy off of the center pin and the shield diverting it to, to the surge components and protecting the radio. Again, instantaneous turn on and no degradation. Okay, last but not least in the protection world is your AC protection. So often I have folks go out to a site and they focus on the ethernet, they focus on the DC because that's where the radio is. That's where the exposure level is that they're, that's most that's most popular, that's most well known about is, oh, what's gonna hit my tower, right? But you gotta think about what's the utility doing to you as well, okay? We're, the utility is an aging, decrepit power grid out there that is constantly doing crazy things to try to deliver power to an increasing demanding population. Because of that, they often deliver bad power. In addition, if lightning populates on the utility line, those are big cables coming into your facility that have the ability to bring a lot of energy into your facility. So you have to protect that AC line. You can protect that AC line in a couple of different ways. You can protect in the cabinet at the equipment with a DIN rail mounted type product you see on the top. That's a uh, 120 volt, um, 75 KA DIN rail mounted device. We have those available in uh, multiple voltages. We also have plug-in style protection. So keep in mind, you may have a cabinet out there and you've got a UPS in that cabinet, right? I've heard folks say, oh, I got a UPS. Well, 
a UPS is a very expensive surge protector. Take the SLN here, plug it in for less than $100, and keep your $400 UPS online, operational, and intact, and let us act as your sacrificial lamp. And then if you have a whole panel that may be feeding a site of, of equipment, you can use what we call a brick style AC surge protector that would install on the panel. So the SP50 uh, you see down here, uh, the SP50RS, that would go on a panel and it would uh, be in parallel off of a breaker. And now it will protect everything on that breaker. I mean, sorry, everything off of that panel, every breaker in that panel, whatever it's feeding would now be protected. So these are all great ways to protect your AC power coming into your system. Transtector also makes power boxes or power cabinets where we'll take that surge protector protection and we'll integrate it into a cabinet with power distribution. So if you want to drop a, a cabinet on a site that um, can deploy power and has integrated surge protection in there, let us know this one right here happens to be a version that has a couple of uh, um, up to 20 amp breakers in it. So this would be for a real small compact site with uh, low power usage, but we also make these available for um, sites with up to 100 amps of requirements or even, even larger. You may not need um, a UL listed AC power protection cabinet. Perhaps you just want a NEMA cabinet to put your equipment in that would have um, AC convenience outlets and maybe some heating or cooling in there. If so, Transtector has a huge line of NEMA boxes, um, white, black, aluminum, polycarbonate, you name it. We have a NEMA box available that has all the different kinds of configurations you would need out there. And we have the knowledge to go along with these products as well in that um, we can perform grounding classes grounding and protection classes. Uh, these are four hour virtual classes. If you have a, uh, a field crew that you want to educate on the basics of grounding, um, the class would cover, you know, why do we need grounding, the, the basics of single point grounding, how to ground AC and DC systems, how to ground communication systems, shield grounding. It really gives um, the folks who take the class there's a lot of people out there who ground things because they know it's supposed to be done, but they don't know why. So once you need to leave this class, you would understand the why, and quite often that helps you <laughs> implement a lot better. So we're gonna close out protection. Um, I don't want to leave without just giving a quick shout out to our antenna brands that Streakwave supports here, KP and Radio Waves. You'll see here um, on this diagram, we have a full breadth of antennas available. Um, real quick, I just want to you know, kind of focus on CBRS and C-band because that's the hot item out there right now. So keep in mind, you can contact Streakwave to get um, KP antennas, uh, Omni antennas for CBRS. We've got C-band sector antennas and brand new, we took our radio waves backhaul antennas and they now cover both C-band and CBRS, okay? So if you look here on this um, page here, you'll see the um, two, three, four, and six footers all now cover the full spectrum of CBRS and C-band. So even if you're not using C-band or, or CBRS or one or the other right now, you can future-proof your installation by putting an antenna out there that covers both bands. Okay, we are at the end here, and I'm gonna be open for questions. Hopefully there are some good ones out there. Great, thanks, Jason. I did get one question, um, so I'm gonna read it to you. Is there a case where you want to put AC isolation between a PoE supplying inside network switches that is supplying outside equipment, such as a camera, or is the data line protection sufficient? Okay, so um, you're, you got a camera, it's PoE fed. Uh, you're gonna have AC power coming into the system. You wanna put an AC surge protector on that AC power. Um, and then what's gonna happen is somewhere in the system, it's gonna convert that AC to DC, right? So um, 
on that ethernet line, we want to put the DPR right at the bottom of that ethernet line. And this is after the AC to DC conversion, okay? So now what we're doing is we're, we provided the, the protection from anything coming in on the AC source. And now we want to make sure that anything coming from the outside will, 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 uh, won't populate onto the rack mounted equipment or the cabinet equipment. So you put that DPR at the bottom of the ethernet line. And then you put that ALPU F140 up at the top of that ethernet line uh, at the camera and you're, you're done. You don't need anything else. As long as you've got shielded cables, shielded jacks, and all of that protection I just mentioned, you're using a single point ground system, there's nothing else required. Great. And, and if any, if there's, I'll just throw it at my phone number, if anyone wants to write it down, if whoever asked that question wants to discuss it further, 813-951, 2986. That's my my mobile number. Great. Thanks, Jason. Um, I hope that answered that question. The next question I have, is there ever a need to install Ethernet surges at both ends? Yes, always a need. So the reason why that question comes up and, and the reason why Transsector, we work so hard at trying to, to get this information out there there's no standard out there that talks about how to protect outdoor Ethernet equipment. IEEE doesn't have a standard, UL, NEC. There's nothing that says, here's how to apply protection for the Ethernet line. So uh, I mentioned our, our website. You know, If you go there, there's a, a best practices in Ethernet protection uh, white paper available. Um, we've worked with several OEMs to bring their equipment into our lab to prove out the best way to protect this Ethernet-fed equipment. We've done it with uh, radio OEMs and we've done it with camera OEMs. In each situation, when we when we put the, the protection at both ends of the ethernet feed, and then we hit that ethernet cable with uh, with a transient event. And, um, you know, we've done up to 2000 amps of surge events in these, in these tests. When there's protection in place on both ends of the equipment, no damage to the equipment. As soon as you remove that protection though, We've seen damage with a low, as little as a hundred amp surge event. So the answer to the question is, it's imperative to protect both ends. When you're dealing with an induced event, right? You've got a transient event that caught that you know a lightning strike nearby your your tower. You know it's not the direct strike that we're really concerned about. It's the induced event. When you have that that energy get induced on a cable, there's no traffic cop to say, hey, energy, I want you to go to the top or I want you to go to the bottom. That energy is going to go wherever it wants to, and in most cases, it's going to go both ways. Because of that, we need protection on both ends of that line. And I'm done. <laughs> awesome. Um, let's see here. Um, what is the cost for the virtual course that you mentioned earlier in the presentation? Uh, the MSRP for the four-hour course is about $3,000. Um, we do work with our partners and key customers to bring that cost down. Um, you know, maybe we'll, in some cases, we work with StreakWave. We may co-sponsor the event. And, uh, you know, depending on the end user and the, the type of project you're working on, we can get that cost down to a more manageable level. Great. Um, next question uh, from this customer here. Uh, they service a number of ham radio operators. What coax protection would you recommend for their radios? So I think that's going to be low frequency. Um, so here's the, when you use polyphaser inductor-based technology, it's very important that we understand what the, the center frequency is or the frequency you're going to pass. The inductors are tuned to be able to pass a certain frequency. Gas tube technology has one advantage in, a, in an RF protector in that it can pass everything from say DC to 2,500 megahertz, right? When we go to the inductor-based technology, we narrow that band pass um, as a result of the technology. So I think ham radio is down at a lower frequency, if I recall correctly. So I think you'd want to use our VHF which operates as far as the best protector goes, our VHF 
B50 operates from 150 to 500 megahertz. And um, that's inductor-based technology. And um, I think that's probably your best option. If I'm off on your frequency, feel free to reach out to me and, and, and I'll get you the right product. Great, thank you. And so the next one I have here, um, they're asking, have you ever heard of a case where a fire was started in an equipment room and as a result of a strike without proper surge protection and if insurance would deny such claim? I have heard of fires starting um, due to improper grounding and a lack of good surge protection um and i have pictures i can i'd be happy to share i i, I think we should do another webinar maybe someday on you know horror stories of bad surge protection i got some great photos um but uh so yes it can happen um in, as far as insurance goes i i don't know i don't know the details i know there's jurisdictions out there there is a a, a a standard you can drive your your system towards, which is called UL96A, and that's a uh, lightning protection certification. And in some regions of the country, if you have that UL96A certification, in order to get that, you have to have you have to have properly rated and designed and UL listed surge protection on the site, as well as proper grounding, and you have to have some lightning rods and and dissipators installed, and then you have someone come out there and they inspect the site and they give you that UL96A certification. And then if something happens, insurance does cover it, but I don't think that's nationwide. I think that's that's kind of regional. So if you're interested in, in that kind of a thing, I would research UL96A and then see if it applies to your, your area of the country. Awesome. Uh, here we have, what's the correct model for Cam Radio HF-1.5? to 300 megahertz to 300 watts. 300 megahertz? 30 megahertz. 30 Angela? No, 30, 30? megahertz. Mm -hmm. Okay, 30. Yeah, so that's the one other deficiency on the inductor-based technology is we don't go that low. So you do have to use one of our gas tube-based products to go that low in frequency but we do have a nice design. Our ISB50 uses a gas tube with a, um, a blocking diode on the center pin. So we add a little extra technology in there to, to help um, increase the performance and offset the deficiency of the gas tube only type devices out there. So um, again, the proper product for that 30 megahertz application would be the ISB50. Perfect. Um, I know that this webinar is being recorded, but is there any way that you can provide um, the slide deck that you presented today that we can also share it with everyone that attended? Happy to do it. Perfect. Um, I don't see any other further questions, so thank you attendees and thank you, Jason, for a fabulous presentation and answering all those questions. Um, is there any last minute things that you wanted to add on? No, I appreciate uh... Streetway putting this together, getting all the customers on the line and uh, the long relationship we've had with you folks. Again, I'm, I'm I, as you can tell, I love talking about this stuff. So if you have any questions down the road, feel free to reach out to me. I'd, I'd love to help you out. Perfect. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Jason. Have a great day. You too.